Okay, let's start. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salam ala Rasulih al Kareem. Rabbi Shrahli Sadri wa Yassirli Amri Wahlul Uqdatan min Lisani Yafqahu Qawli. Welcome to the sixth session of uh, the evolution of fiqh. And in the last session, we basically started talking about the spirit of the Quran and the laws um, which were revealed in the Quran, they uh, obviously had a reason, had a purpose. So um, the thing which we concentrated on last time was that it's not just enough for one to follow the law on the surface, but one needs to understand the spirit of the law, um, which will give one a better understanding of the law, but also give one the understanding on when and how to apply the law, uh, which is very important. Because a lot of people, uh, and even people who gain a lot of knowledge, um, their concentration is memorizing texts, um, memorizing laws, uh, references, which is all very important, obviously. Um, but little attention is paid to uh, the spirit of the law, how this law should be applied, what are the conditions of the law, um, what was the purpose of Allah when he sent the law, what was Allah trying to achieve, what was Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him trying to achieve through the laws. So in Islam it's very important that we do not lose focus of the original intent behind the laws. Um, and that is why if you look at the Khulafa Rashidun, the first four caliphs, they were so good. Uh, one of the reasons was because they not only knew the law itself, but they knew how to apply it. They were good administrators. Like Umar ibn Khattab, he had this understanding when the Islamic law comes into effect, what are its limitations and when to suspend it. Like we mentioned the story of him suspending the law of cutting the hand off during the year of the famine. So, um, so that's what we are focusing on in this stage and we're still in the foundational stage. What is the foundational stage? Can you remind me? What does it mean that you know the Islamic law is in its foundational stage? This is like when the sources were coming down. Right. right, so this is the stage of revelation. This is the stage of the Quran and the Sunnah. There are no other sources. There is no human uh, opinions. This is the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. There is only one man who, who, is, who is basically the boss. You know, he tells you what is halal, what is haram. He tells you when to apply the law, when not to apply the law. He tells you, you know, when something has been abrogated. Um, he tells you when the new law comes in. So, you know, everything is very simple and everything is straightforward at this stage. Um, there is no confusion, there are no madhabs, there are no differences of opinion. Um, you know, uh, not to say that the Sahaba did not have differences of opinion when they understood the law, but the thing is that whenever they would have that, they would go to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and he would clarify those differences. Uh, as opposed to the later stages, once the Prophet, peace be upon him, dies, and there is no more Quran coming down, there is no more revelation, then you don't really have an absolute way of knowing which opinion, you know, should we go with. Is this opinion correct or is that opinion correct? And that is why in the later stages we, we find these different schools of thought and their differences uh, start coming up and even the uh, sects which emerge later on, political sects, uh, they were a product of uh, a lack of revelation. And that's why Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, sometimes they would visit uh, certain, uh, certain women, uh, certain aunts of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and they would cry together whenever they would mention the Qur'an uh, not being revealed anymore. They would miss the Qur'an. See, for us, it's just, it's always been there. You know, that's what the Qur'an is. It starts from Surah Al-Fatiha, it ends with Surah Al-Nas. But for the Sahaba, it was an ongoing process. They're waiting for another one, they're waiting for another one, you know, and they're delighted. They memorize it, they practice it, they get excited, and now they're waiting. Maybe Allah is going to reveal more. And then when that process stops, then that's a big setback for them. You know, they, they could not imagine a life without Allah's guidance coming down. They could not imagine a life without the Messenger of Allah, 
there guiding them, showing them how to do things properly. So this is the foundational state and we are still talking about the spirit of the Quranic legislation. So the Quran itself announces that it was revealed to reform human condition. So what is the basic spirit behind Islamic law, behind the laws which are revealed by the Quran? Is to reform human beings, is to make the human societies better, is to uh, you know, enhance human character, is to uh, you know, take to a, a higher level the human qualities, the noble qualities which we are blessed with as human beings. So that's what the basic uh, spirit behind Islamic law is, to make things better for the human beings, to enhance uh, their condition. Also, Islam did not erase all pre-Islamic customs and practices. Instead, it removed every facet of corruption and cancelled all customs which were harmful to the society. What does that mean? Usually what happens is when a new system comes into place, it just abolishes the old system completely. Okay. One government comes into place, it wants to abolish all the laws of the previous government. All the policies were wrong, they were bad. We are going to show you the good policies. We are going to make new policies. Okay. But with the Quran and the Sunnah and Islamic law, you find that it's not an ego-based system. Where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes in and says, I'm going to tell you what's right and wrong. All those people before me, they knew nothing. They were Ill illiterate, they were ignorant, you know, they had no good in them. That's not how his attitude was. Okay? And that's not how the attitude of Islam is. Islam recognizes that as human beings, people themselves come up with a lot of good things for themselves. People, you know, as human beings, we want the best for ourselves. So even non-Muslim societies, they understand the concepts of justice, they understand the concept of, you know, um, humanitarian efforts. They understand charity, they understand, you know, professionalism, you know, these are all good things which we have come up with ourselves without a revelation being there, without a book being there. Okay, so when Islam comes to a new culture, a new society, it does not just completely eradicate that, that society's customs and traditions. What it does is it keeps the good ones, the good things which are already there. Okay, Alhamdulillah, we don't need to change them. But what it does is it focuses on the evils in that society. It focuses on the corruption in that society and tries to purify those elements okay, without touching the good parts of that society. That is why Islam and culture, there is always, you know, we're talking about Islam and culture and we do a lot of things which we consider to be Islam, but that is culture, right? But not everything in that is haram or, or wrong, you know? For example, the different kinds of dresses which we find in different cultures being worn. Sisters, for example, covering themselves up in different ways. You go to Egypt one way, you go to Pakistan another way, you go to Saudi Arabia another way. You know, you have all these cultural differences. As long as modesty is there, doesn't matter what kind of dress they, they're wearing in that culture. So Islam has that flexible aspect where it can absorb cultures. It has the ability to absorb different traditions, different cultures, different languages, different kinds of people, different mentalities. You know, people who are illiterate, Islam has something for them. Very simple. Okay, the five pillars. Don't worry about the complications of fiqh and don't worry about the complications of hadith and you know all of that stuff. Okay, but if you are an intellectual, you want to you know exercise the powers of your brain, then Islam also provides you with that avenue. Okay, there are deep sciences which you can keep on going and going and going and you will really derive a lot of, lot of good from that. So Islam has that ability to absorb the human beings as a whole, no matter what kind of human beings they are, no matter which culture they come from. So this is exactly what Islam did when the Quran was revealed. The Arabs before Islam, they had a lot of good things they used to do. Okay, for example, they were honorable people. For example, they were doing good in languages, poetry. For example, they were hospitable. When somebody would come to their house, the Arabs would do anything to you know, be good to these people. For example, they were honorable people. They did not allow anyone to you know, attack them, humiliate them. For example, they were people who loved freedom. Arabs were never ruled by anyone before. You know. So these were good qualities in the Arabs. Obviously, they had a lot of bad things too. So what Islam did was, it said, okay, the good things you have, no problem. We will keep them. 
Islam is not going to change those good things. But let's talk now about the evils which you guys are doing and let's try to come up with something better. And that's what Allah did with that. Consequently, Islamic legislation forbade the interest because it was unfair advantage of the less fortunate members of society. One of the things Islam came really hard on, and if you look at the seven major sins, one of the major sins is interest, dealing in interest transactions. Where I come to you and I say, I need a loan. I'm really, really needy. Can you give me a hundred dollars? And you say, okay, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars. But if you don't return these hundred dollars to me within the next month, I'm going to charge interest on it. So you have to pay me 105 instead or 120 instead. So what you're basically doing is you're taking advantage of my difficult situation. Why did I come to you in the first place to borrow money from you? If I was rich, I wouldn't have come to you. I came to you because I'm poor, I'm in need, I have an emergency or whatever. And now you, instead of helping me out, what you're doing is you're making money out of me. You're saying, okay, I'm going to give you 100, but I'm going to take 120 back. So that's like exploitation of human needs. So that was an evil which was present in that society and culture. And so Islam said, no, no way. We're going to change that. The same thing here in, in our times and cultures. Uh, the interest-based economies, they're basically, they just make some people richer and richer and richer. And then the other people, they keep going in this circle of debt and they never come out of it and they end up paying much much more than what they originally borrowed you borrowed a hundred dollars and you end up paying you know four hundred dollars so that's exploitation of people's wealth which is not allowed another thing islam came hard on was fornication fornication and adultery due to its exploitation of women and the destruction of family bonds a lot of people don't understand why are there so harsh punishments in Islam when it comes to these sexual crimes you know especially in the West these things are common where people you know they don't feel any problem with uh, you know having relationships with multiple partners throughout their life and you know without marriage and they're like you know what's the what's the problem in that you know what's the problem in being a, a homosexual for example you know, Islam, if you go to the spirit of it, you will find that one of the important things in Islam is family. And we talked about family last time, that one of the things with shaitan, he's really happy, is when a family breaks. And one of the things which attacks the family structure is irresponsible sexual behavior. Because that is going to harm and attack the roots of the family. Because no husband and no wife is going to you know, by nature, going to like this. If, you know, if, if, if the husband is going out and, you know, playing around with women or the wife goes around and does that, you know, nobody is going to like that. And so it will result in separations. It will result in rifts. Um, homosexuality will encourage what? You know, having a non-nuclear family structure. And so then you have to see what are the advantages of having a father and a mother in the house as opposed to having two fathers in the house or having two mothers in the house you know how are the children affected by it what are the psychological uh, you know needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created men and women then he created them for each other because they complete each other there are parts in a man's uh, part in a man a man's psychology which a woman can complete okay and then there are ish areas in women's emotions and psychology in her life which a man completes okay and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with these genders so that we can cooperate with each other so so that we can help each other attain the goal which is to worship and and you know obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it causes a lot of corruption in those cultures and those societies and we're not even talking here about the diseases which result from the you know the uh, irresponsible sexual behavior like AIDS and syphilis and all these STDs which we hear about today. So since the pre-Islamic Arabs were, you know, this was one of their weaknesses. As we said that they had these multiple forms of marriages. Um, one of them was prostitution, which was allowed, where a woman would just hang out, hang a white flag outside her house and any man could come in. Another one was where a, a woman would sleep with a number of men and then whenever the child was born, she would choose which which person was the father. 
So they had all these weird forms of marriage. Uh, when your father died, you inherited all his wives as your wives. So Islam came in and said, no, this is not acceptable. This is going to harm you. This harms the society as a whole. This, you know, makes the, the makes problems in the development of the children who are growing in such households. So Islam cleaned that act, purified that area and encouraged the marriage. Alcohol also was prohibited because of the physical, psychological and spiritual damage which it inflicts on both the individual and society as a whole. Um, if you look at statistics, even in our times, you will find that alcohol is the leading cause of death. You know, the accidents, for example, road accidents, the primary cause of those road accidents is driving under the influence. Okay, that's why there are so many strict laws against driving under the influence. But that does not mean that that will stop if you have strict laws and you allow it. From one end you're allowing it and the other end you have strict laws against it. You know, that doesn't work. Islam works from both hands. Islam says, let's try to prevent it from happening. And then when it happens, let's be very strict on it. So you have to work from both ends. If you just work from one end, you try to prevent it. But then there are no laws against it. If you abuse it, nobody will care. On the other hand, if you have very strict laws against it, but you also are promoting it from one side, once again, nobody will really benefit from those laws. So you have to understand the spirit of Islamic law is prevention and then very strict penalties if those, if those areas are extremely important like these ones, like alcohol. Um, there are some people in our times who claim, for example, that a little bit of alcohol is very good for your health. Um, you know, a, a glass a day or something like that, you know, it uh, reduces uh, chances of heart attacks and stuff like that. And there have been studies which have come uh, regarding the you know, uses of alcohol. Now, once again, the interesting thing is in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admits and says that there are benefits in alcohol. But what he says is that the evils of alcohol the disadvantages, the damage it causes to society and the individual are far greater. It outweighs the benefits. So there might be benefits, medical benefits or whatever in alcohol. But then there are also medical problems it causes. A, a recent study came out which said that the same scenario where you just drink one glass of alcohol, wine or something, you know, per day, and it reduces your chances of a heart attack, increases your chances of cancer by 70%. So the same thing, yeah, it, it is helping you not have a heart attack, but it's going to give you a cancer. You know, so, and it increases your chances by 70%, which is like a far greater uh, risk or far greater, you know, improvement in the chances than what it would have been the other way around. So, Alhamdulillah, we don't need these figures. We don't need these statistics to prove to us that alcohol is an evil. You know, we know it by human nature. And even the non-Muslims know it. It's just that, it's just that it's the desire. It's just that it's something which they enjoy. It's, some, it's something which is part and parcel of their culture, as it was in the pre-Islamic Arabia, and they don't want to change. So Islamic law, always the spirit behind Islamic law is not that Allah wants to boss around or it's not that, you know, Islam wants to, you know, boss around and say, okay, this is the way and you better do it. If you don't do it, then we will punish you. No, the spirit is that it's good for you. The spirit is if you believe that these laws are coming from Allah and you believe Allah created you and you believe Allah is a good God. He intends good for you. If you believe in all of these things, then these laws are good for you. Okay, whether you understand how they're good for you or you don't understand. That's why at the end of the day, we say Allah knows best. We can just try our best to understand the reasons and the spirit and do our research. I mean, obviously, in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, these kind of researches were not there. The Sahaba did not say, well, no, Prophet, you need to prove to us. How many per how much percentage cancer goes up and how much heart attack is reduced and this and that. They didn't ask these questions because they believe that he is the messenger of Allah and he knows best. So it, there's nothing wrong in trying to know these things because it only increases your faith. But at the end of the day, that's not why we believe in these things. Meaning if the, even if the figures said other things, you know, then what would we do? Would we change our faith and say, no, since the figures suggest alcohol is good, so let's 
you know, let's start drinking. No, because Allah knows best and our knowledge is limited. Also, if you look at the trade practices, Islam reformed by making the basis of trade mutual consent and by disallowing all deceptive business transactions. If you look at the details Islam provides in business transactions and what kind of transactions are forbidden. You know, one of the kinds of transactions which I recently studied is the Islamic insurance system. Islamic insurance. Now all of us, we know what an insurance is. You either have a health insurance in this country or if you drive a car, you have a, you know, vehicle insurance. You know, we, we have all of these insurances. Um, recently, I read a statistic on that which said that only 3% of whatever is collected by these insurance companies goes back to the people. So 97% goes to them as a profit, you know, and you're paying all your life, you know, every month for your medical insurance or your car insurance or whatever, and you gain nothing out of it. Okay, it's basically taking your money away. You have no benefit from it. And whenever you do claim, let's say you run into some trouble and you made a claim and they said, okay, we're going to send you a check for your car to repair it. What happens after it to your insurance? It goes up. And then they still want you to pay part of it. And they still want you to pay part of it. They don't cover everything, right? Unless it was, you know, the kind of coverage you had covered everything. So, subhanAllah, the, you, you end up paying for it anyway. Because your insurance goes up. Now, why should it go up? You've been paying for 10 years. Yes, they should really cover everything for you, but they don't do that. So, subhanAllah, it's, it's a system based on corruption. It's a system based on benefiting a few companies at the expenses of, of the society. Now, compare this to the Islamic insurance system, which is called Kifala in Arabic. This insurance system is where a few group of people, they get together, they pool in their money. Say, okay, all of us are going to give $100 a month. Okay. And if anything happens to any one of us, we need the money, we're going to help this person. So the Islamic insurance system is based on cooperation. It's based on helping those people who are part of that insurance plan. And the greatest thing about the Islamic insurance system is once the period of insurance ends, you get your money back. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. What's that brother? No, no, bathroom. Bathroom. bathroom is right there. Yes. 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 So in the Islamic insurance system, once the period of the insurance ends, you go there and they give you all the money you have given ever to them. You know, your money is your money. It's not like you gave it to them and you, you forget about your money. You're never going to get it back. You get your money back. And whatever money you put in, they invest it in businesses and you actually get the profits. You are part of the, the company. You enjoy the share of being the owner of the company. You enjoy the profits which the company makes. So it's very, very different than the insurance systems which we have in the regular you know, commercial banks and you know, all these insurance companies. They are based on ripping us. They are based on taking advantage of us. They are based on you know, making themselves rich as compared to the Islamic insurance system which is based on cooperation, help, which is based on you being the owner of your money, you lose nothing. If you die, your family gets that money back. You know, you're always covered in the Islamic insurance system. So subhanAllah, everything in Islam is based on a reason, a benefit for the human beings. Okay. Now you might be asking, how do these people make money? Okay, they're, they're taking care of your transactions and everything. How do they make money? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, brother. Yeah, I am in the middle of a lecture. It's being recorded. It's being recorded. Yes,
Okay, so going back to the trade practices. So Islam, it abolished all these trade practices. Another trade practice which, alaikum salam, which Islam abolished was um, in agriculture. In agriculture, let's say you are selling your harvest. Yes, sir. This war of Zamzam is actually more than this. Some of the people send it from Saudi Arabia. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Some, uh, some carpets and some. Uh, one of you guys is going to go handy. And. Jazakallah, uh, Faith. I don't know. So then, from them, for the month. For the month, yeah. Mm -hmm. What so is the benefit of those companies itself? That would be the company. Oh, okay. Yes. So the how the how does the company make money? Yeah. Through the investments, basically. Okay. Because the money they're going to get from you, they're going to invest it in business. And whatever the profit comes, part of the profit goes to them and part of it goes back to you. And that, that's signed before you, you give, give your money and all of those details are in the contract and you sign it with them. Okay? So basically, they don't own your money. Well, all they're doing with your money is they are working with your money. They are like your agents. You own your money. In the Islamic insurance system, your money is your money. It's not their money. In the regular insurance system, once you give that money, it's gone. You will never see it again, okay? Unless you claim it, and even if you claim it, then they're going to increase the insurance and get it back anyway. Okay, so another, way, another one is, for example, if you're selling crops, if you're a farmer or something in Islam, you cannot sell the crops before the harvest, to somebody before the harvest. Why? Because you have no control over weather conditions. You have no control over pests. You have no control over what happens to that, the, that crop in its final shape. So you can only sell in Islam what you really have. This is, this is Islamic law. It's kind of like, uh, like speculating. That's speculation. Yeah. Speculation and speculative transactions are not allowed in Islam. Anything which you're not sure about how it's going to pan out in the end, you cannot do that. Also, if you don't have goods with you, they are somewhere else. You cannot sell it to somebody unless I have that in my position. I cannot say, give me a hundred dollars and go over there and get that thing. No, I am selling it to you. I need to give you that thing, hand it over to you. So Islam is very, very careful when it comes to the money of people. So that the money of people is not destroyed. It's not unlawfully taken. Okay, it's based on mutual consent and it's based on mutual benefit. You benefit and I benefit. Okay. So all those transactions were cancelled out by Islam, um, which were in practice before Islam. The existing system of marriage was organized by confirming certain forms and prohibiting others, which were in fact fornication of something or something close to it. And I already talked about the different forms of marriage which the Arabs used to practice, and most of them were, you know, basically fornication. They were not real marriages. The basis of divorce was also recognized, but its pronouncements were limited. Now, once again, this is based on the benefit of humanity. Imagine a real life situation where a woman is being abused by her husband. And you tell this woman, no, once you marry this person, he is your husband forever. You cannot get out of this situation until you die or he dies. Okay? And even in many cultures, including pre-Islamic Arabia, the widows were looked down upon. If her husband died, you know, she is no longer considered to be of any value to society. Her value is with her husband. In ancient India, they used to have the practice of the sati, where the husband would die and she would have to burn with him on the, the pyre. They would throw her you know, in the pyre to die because she's of no value without her husband. No, Islam is a religion which is a practical religion. It recognizes that there will be situations in marriage where you have no other choice but to separate and that is better for you. Obviously, the, the, the focus and the stress is let's try our best to make this work. 
But then there will be situations it won't work. Let's say you have an, a really unreasonable person on one side and you, you cannot talk to this person and you know, he or she, they, they're not willing to understand or whatever. So you move away and I move away and we start a new life. And the divorced person does not have any, uh, any you know, taboos or any kind of you know, these uh, uh, ill, Ill uh, you know, they're not viewed as um, unproductive members of society, useless members of society. They're viewed as hum human beings who have a right to live, who, had to, who have a right to restart their families. The woman should remarry, the man should remarry and, and restart. And that, that's how it is. So Islam is a very practical religion. Um, in Christianity, for example, where you don't have in certain forms of Christianity, you, you, divorce is not allowed. It's considered to be haram or forbidden or whatever. You know, it's very unpractical, very unpractical because what are you going to do in these real life situations? So Islam is not an idealistic religion. Islam is not an idealistic religion where you just live in theory. In theory, those things sound really nice. No, Islam is a practical religion where Allah, he knows how we live and we're not perfect and we don't live in an ideal world. So based on that principle, Allah has devised laws which are practical, where yes, he stresses on the ideals. They are the desired laws. They are the desired you know, outcome of society. But if you don't achieve them, then you have this way out, this practical way out so that you can restart. So what, whatever was harmful was removed and whatever was beneficial was confirmed. Simple as that. Okay? If there is something harming the society, Islam is going to try to change it. If it's something which is benefiting the society, that's great. We'll keep it. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 157. It commands them to do righteousness and prohibits them from evil. And it makes allowable to them the good things and makes forbidden to them all the filth or all the evil things okay so very simple rule anything which will benefit we'll keep it anything which will harm we will try to change it and here in this verse it refers to revelation the quran so the quran recommends good prohibits evil okay the quran encourages productivity the quran encourages positive and it prohibits negatives and evils in society and filth Whatever Islam confirmed is considered an integral part of the divine code. So whatever is considered to be halal in Islam or haram in Islam is not based on human reasoning or understanding. It's considered to be divine. Okay? Why is that? Because only Allah himself has the authority to declare halal and haram. Even the most noble, the most you know, pious human being, the most learned scholar cannot put himself in a position and say, I will tell you what is halal, what is haram. No, what the scholars they do is they look at the Quran and the Sunnah and they try to derive from it what Allah made halal and haram. They're not saying that it's, you know, this halal and haram is from me. They're saying, in my opinion, Allah has made this haram. In my opinion, Allah has made this halal. Their opinions could be wrong. But their basis is that this is from Allah. That's what their effort is. And they're trying to extract law that this is from Allah. Why are these laws considered divine? Because some of the practices were inherited from earlier generations to which prophets had been sent. A good example is that of the Hajj, which was instituted by the prophets Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. So what we're basically saying is, when Islam came to, to Arabia, why did it keep some of the practices and made them halal? Is it because we agree with the pre-Islamic Arabs and say, well, they were so smart that they came up with all these nice things? No, not, not just that. What we're saying is that they, were, they had remnants of truth from the earlier generations, from the earlier prophets, like the Hajj. Hajj rituals were instituted by Ibrahim and Ismail. The Arabs, they continued with the Hajj rituals, but over time they corrupted some of the Hajj rituals. So when Islam came, it removed all those corruptions, the corrupted forms of the Hajj and said, okay, the rest of them are good. What were some of the corruptions in the Hajj? Do you remember? 
the uh, how they would sell the uniforms and take advantage of people? The Quraysh would sell the uniforms. You know, say if you don't buy the uniforms from us, then you have to go around the, the Kaaba naked. Okay, what Obviously else? the idols. Also the idols, so you know, making Hajj for the idols or visiting the idols or you know, making sacrifices for the idols. One of the things they used to do was they used to sacrifice the animal for their idols and then they used to, uh, to uh, throw the blood of that animal on the Kaaba. You know, so this was something which Islam abolished and said this is not required. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to throw the blood of the animals on the Kaaba for your sacrifice to be accepted or anything. So they had some of these evils. Another thing was that the Quraysh, they said, we're not going to go out to Muzdalifa. You know, when, when the pilgrims, they go from one area to another, one of the areas they visit is Muzdalifa. The Quraysh said that is for the non-Quraysh. That rule is for the non-Quraysh. The Quraysh will stay where we are when we make Hajj. We don't go with them. So Allah said, no, you have to go with them. It's the same rule for everyone, whether you're Quraysh or non Quraysh, whether you're from Mecca, not, not from Mecca, it doesn't matter. So they had made up their own rules and rituals, uh, which would give them a superior status as opposed to the rest of the, the Arab tribes. So Islam came and abolished those forms of rituals which they had. Another thing is that Islamic principles do not contradict human reason, nor are they unintelligible. Instead, they free the human intellect from irrationality. Consequently, they recognize the useful results of human intellectual activity. So as, as I said earlier, that if Allah has confirmed something in the Quran, and we as human beings also have arrived at the same conclusion due to our human nature, due to our intellect, then there is no problem. Okay. It doesn't mean that we, that we are trying to subject Allah to our human nature. What it means is that our human nature is in sync with what Allah has revealed. Because who is the source of the human nature? Who is the one who created the human nature? Allah. Who is the one who sent the laws? Allah. So both of them go back to Allah. So that if they are in agreement, then Alhamdulillah, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, if the confirmed practices were not present, Islam would have institu instituted them due to the existing human need for them. So let's say there were no Hajj practices in Mecca before Islam. Then Islam would have come and said the same thing, that you need to start making Hajj. And this is what you do in Hajj. So it is divine. Hajj is divine. You cannot say, well, Hajj rituals are borrowed from pre-Islamic Arabia. They, these are pagan rituals. Why are we following them today? No, they are divine rituals because number one, they were already there before the Arabs twisted those rules. Number two, that they are in sync with human nature. And number three, if the Arabs were not doing it, Allah would have revealed laws in order to make them happen. So we cannot say that these things are uh, man-made laws. These are not man-made laws, these are divine laws. One of the spirits of the Quranic legislation in laws is the removal of difficulty. Okay, that's what the Islamic laws aim to do. Your life is difficult, let's try to make it easy. Okay? Let's try to make things easy for the, for the human being. Islamic laws are not meant to be a burden creating difficulties for man, but in order for the man to grow. But from the Western perspective, from the Christian perspective or the modern Jewish perspective, the Hindu perspective, any religion, modern day, if you ask them, you come to Islam and you start following the Islamic laws, what are they going to say? Is it, is, has it made their life easy or more difficult? They're going to say it's more difficult. I didn't have to wake up 5 o'clock for prayer in the morning, now I have to. I didn't have to save money for pilgrimage, now I have to. I didn't have to give charity mandatory, now I have to. Okay? I didn't have to fast in, a, in the month of Ramadan, now I have to. And you're saying that Islam makes life easy? Islamic laws have made my life more difficult. Okay? So how do we respond to this claim? Allah is saying that He has made Islam easy. Islamic law is there to ease things, not make them difficult. How do we respond to this? I was having this conversation with somebody the other day who was a Christian and they were talking about all the rules and things and I was telling them that 
the Islamic rules aren't really any more difficult than the Christian rules, and in lots of places they're actually easier. It's just that you don't actually follow the Christian rules anymore. It's just all like, right. you know, just like go to church on Sunday and you'll be right. all right. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what the point is. That when we say that Islam made the life easy or the rules are easy, then we are talking in relative terms. Meaning relative to how the rules were in the previous nations. Okay, How the rules were for the nation of Musa a.s. How the rules were for the nation of Isa a.s. Those rules were much, much, much harder than the Islamic rules. So Islam actually came and made life easy. And one of the examples is fasting, for example. If you go back to the early Christian community, they used to fast 40 days. Instead of us fasting now 30 days. In Ramadan, they used to fast 40 days. And their fasting was from night to night. One meal in the night and then you start fasting again. Our fasting is from dawn to sunset. You can eat the entire night if you want. Right? The uh, prayers, for example, the previous nations, they were not allowed to pray anywhere except in the temple. If you want to pray, you have to come to the masjid. You cannot pray at home. You cannot pray under a tree. You cannot pray in your, in your, in your business, in your store or whatever. Islam came and made it easy. He said, as long as you're praying, pray, praying in a pure area, the whole earth is a masjid for you. So actually, if you look at Islamic laws compared to the previous laws which were there in place, Islam made it much, much easier. But when you compare it to the watered down versions of Christianity, the watered down versions of Hinduism, the watered down versions of other religions, of, of course, you'll find it hard because you're, you're going from nothing to something. You're going from no rules at all to some rules, you'll say it's hard. But if you're going from a lot of rules to the Islamic rules, then you'll say, wow, life is easy. So we're not really comparing Islamic laws with the non-existent watered down laws which are there in other religions right now. What we're saying is that Islamic laws are much easier than the previous laws which were there. The previous Sharia which was there, the Sharia of Musa, the Sharia of Isa, the Sharia of Ibrahim, they were much, much, much harder than our Sharia. Okay? And the rewards also, we get easy rewards. One night, night of power, you gain it, it's 80 some years of worship, right? Laylatul Qadr. Whereas in the previous times, they had to worship those 80 years to get that reward. For us, we don't have to worship 80 years to get that reward. We just worship that one night to gain that reward. Okay? In Ramadan, each deed is multiplied 70 times. Okay? So there's lots of bonuses, easy paths, shortcuts when it comes to Islamic laws. Okay? But you know, obviously you don't compare it with the current forms of nothingness which is practiced basically. They are designed to facilitate mankind's individual and societal needs. As we said, Islam is a religion of human nature. Islam understands what our needs are. Okay? That's why, for example, things like celibacy are forbidden in Islam. Islam understands you're a human being. You have desires. You need to get married. Okay? That's what happens when you try to curb those human desires and you see what happens in the, in the churches now. Then, then it goes and you, know, you, you start abusing. How many pastors and priests are caught you know, doing things with children? And, you know? One of the reasons is because they have put themselves into such a difficult situation where they've said, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to lead a life of uh, celibacy. I'm going to lead a life uh, away from sexuality. Islam understands that you, this is part and parcel of your, you know, of your needs. Islam understands there are times you need to, you know, you need to fast, you need to eat. Islam doesn't require us to be fasting continuously. It's actually forbidden for us to fast continuously. Islam understands we need sleep. Islam doesn't ask us to pray all night long. No, you pray as much as you can and then you sleep also. You take care of your needs. Okay, that's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, your body has rights on you and Allah has rights on you and your family has rights on you. So Islam is a very, very balanced way of practicing your religion. It's not an extreme way in any, any sense.
Among the pillars on which Islam is based is the removal of unnecessary difficulties wherever possible. Okay? And this is something which we need to work on in our lives. Whenever you see unnecessary complications, try to make things simpler. A lot of times when we're having discussions on, us, on something, then what we start doing is we start hair splitting. It's like going in the finer details of that issue and you know, in details which are not even relevant. You keep going and digging and digging and digging and digging until you make a grave for yourself. <laughs> That's what you end up doing when you dig too much. You, you, you become trapped and you fall into your own grave, like you dig up your own grave. So no, in Islam you don't do that. You don't do what the Bani Israel did when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to sacrifice a calf. Allah told them sacrifice a cow. Allah didn't tell them the color, Allah didn't tell them the weight, Allah didn't tell them, you know, the shape. Just go out there, catch any cow, sacrifice it, you'll be good. But you see what they started doing? Started asking questions. What should be the color of this? So Allah said, okay, this is the color. No, no, we don't understand it really. What should be the age range we're talking about here? Uh, we still don't understand it. Tell us more about it. Until Allah made it so specific for them that it became hard for them to find that kind of a calf. And at the end they found it with one, one young boy, one uh, shepherd, who had that exact description of the calf. And he was a very good businessman. He said, I'll give you the calf, but you have to give me its weight in gold. They had to pay him its weight in gold in order to get that calf so that they could sacrifice it at the end of the day. They would have saved a lot of money and they would have saved a lot of hassle if they had just gone out there and followed the commands of Allah. So whenever Allah tells you to do something, don't try to unnecessarily dig and find out the details and this and that. Do whatever Allah is telling you. Do whatever Allah is telling you. Don't try to come up with reasons and okay, no, no, I want to know this and that and how, how it should be done. And, no, whatever is in the religion is enough. You don't need to go beyond that. So Islam is based on removal of difficulty. Allah says in the Quran, Allah does not burden a soul with more than it can bear. The laws of Islam are not designed for <coughs> angels. Meaning, nobody can complain on the day of judgment, Oh Allah, you made the religion too tough. It was out of my range. I couldn't do that. I couldn't get up for Fajr. That was impossible. How could somebody get up for Fajr, Oh Allah? <laughs> That's the prime time for my sleep. No. Allah didn't make it like that. Allah made it possible for you to get up for Fajr if you sleep on time and you put the alarm clock, right? But if you sleep at 4 or 4 a.m. in the morning and you have no alarm clock, then obviously you're not going to get up. So Allah made religion easy for us if we follow it properly. But if we abuse it, don't follow it properly, then we made it difficult for ourselves. Our, you know, it's our own doing. So Allah does not put a burden on a soul more than it can bear. That's why as Muslims we should always believe whatever tests we are going through in our life, no matter how difficult they seem, they were specifically designed for us. Specifically designed, de de designed for us. Why didn't Allah put you in the tests of your brother? I mean imagine, you know, if you are in Palestine right now and suffering like your brothers are suffering. right. Why, why didn't Allah test you like that? Because maybe Allah knows that you cannot, you don't have that ability to go through the, those kind of tests. Okay? Your tests are different. Their tests are different. Okay? You cannot, you cannot, you know, go through the same tests as your brother and maybe your brother cannot go through the same tests as you. Allah has specifically designed tests for each and every individual and there is nothing which happens to you, no testing in your life which is beyond you. Allah has given you the strength to go through those times and to go through those difficulties. The only thing is you have to work hard. If you don't work hard, then you can complain it was too hard. It was too, it's not too hard. It's easy. It's made for you. How can it be too hard? So Allah does not put a burden on a soul more than it can bear. Also Allah says, Allah wishes for you ease and He does not wish difficulty for you. Allah is not a cruel a uh, volume, oppressive kind of, of a God, you know, we're talking about. We're talking about Ar-Rahman, we're talking about Ar-Rahim, we're talking about Al-Wadud, you know, we're talking about Al-Latif, the merciful one, you know, the loving one, the subtle one. 
No, he, he is full of mercy towards his, his creation. How can he put difficulty for you? How can he pass you through things which you know are beyond you? It is impossible that he would do that because he intends for us ease, not difficulty. Also Allah says he did not make any difficulty for you in the religion. There is no excuse for anyone to say religion is too hard. Religion is easy. But what happens sometimes is people make it hard for themselves and on others. For example, when you start following cultural practices and you say this is required, you have to do it this way, this is part of my deen, then you have made your religion more difficult. For example, I know in Pakistan, for example, if you're praying Isha prayer and you do not pray 17 rakahs, the people say you have not prayed your Isha. You have to pray 17 rakahs in order to satisfy the people. <laughs> In order to satisfy Allah, you just need four. Four rakas of Isha prayer. You have prayed your Isha. But in order to satisfy your father, to satisfy your uncles, to satisfy the Imam of the Masjid, did you pray 17? Uh, no, I didn't pray 17. Are you your Isha? You have not prayed your Isha. Go. Go pray 17. Now, obviously, it makes it difficult for this person who is you know, trying to practice his religion and maybe he's just at a lower level right now, he's trying to, to at least catch up on his fault and he will maybe work on the sunnah or the nawafil later on, you know, they put him so, through so much stress that he thinks religion is so hard, I cannot do this, this is beyond me. Yes, brother. My mother's father, uh, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, he said for Karawi it's uh, 20 and nothing, nothing else you can't. Below one. Right. <laughs> yeah, and Tarawi is actually a sunnah. Tarawi is a sunnah. So there is no further attached to the Tarawi. You know, obviously the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, uh, did not leave behind clear instructions as regards to the Tarawi, and there was difference of opinion amongst the Sahaba. Even Umar ibn al Khattab, he said it's 20, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, radiallahu anhu, he said it's 8. So there were differences of opinion amongst the Sahaba on that. But for somebody to say, no, no, you have to pray 20, there's no other way, you have to pray. Actually, in the first place, you don't have to pray Tarawi. You don't have to pray Tarawi. It's not fard on you. It's Sunnah. It's good if you pray it. If you don't pray, you're not to be blamed for it. But, you know, that's how the cultures ha have become right, right now. A person who's not going to pray his Maghrib or Isha, but if he misses his Tarawi, people are like, you can go for Tarawi, brother. Oh, brother, I was not even there for Isha. Well, I, I don't worry about your Isha. But tarawi? You missed your Tarawi prayer, brother? <laughs> so this is how we are, you know. Brother, you missed your Eid prayer? How can you miss your Eid prayer? And the same brother is not going for Juma, and there is no problem. The whole year he has skipped Juma prayer, but since he skipped Eid, it's a big sin now. Juma is, <laughs> is far, is more important than the Eid prayer. So subhanallah, you know, that's how you make religion difficult when you don't know it. That's why knowledge is important. Islamic knowledge is important. You need to know what are the bare minimum requirements of my religion. The bare minimum requirements of our religion are very easy. And that's how we should judge others by the bare minimum requirements. On ourselves, if you want to be as hard on yourself as possible, no problem. You want to say, I have to pray 17 every day, I have to do more, I have to do more. That's fine. You can do whatever you want with yourself. Be as harsh and as hard on yourself as you want. But don't judge other people on the same criteria. Okay? Be soft with the other people. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, one of the uh, Sahaba, he once gave a fatwa on some issue. And somebody asked him about that and he said, this is the answer. And then... The next day, he was talking to somebody and he said, this is what I do because this is required. And so the man said, yesterday you were telling that other person he doesn't need to do it. And now you're telling me that you yourself need to do it. He said, yes, because whenever I'm giving fatwa to other people, I give them the easier option. If I have two opinions to follow, I use the easier ones for the people. Okay, it's okay, no problem. You can do this. But when it comes to my own self, I put myself through the harder option, harder of the two. He really tests himself more than the others. So 
Unfortunately, with us, it's the other way around. When it comes to other people, they have to be hafiz of the Quran, they have to be this. I mean, subhanAllah, when we are selecting wives <laughs> or husbands, that's what I hear from brothers and sisters. Okay, brother, he needs to be a hafiz and he needs to have a job and he needs to earn this much money and, and he, the brother is saying she needs to be this and this and this and this and this and I mean have you looked at your own self brother? What are you doing? Yes you need this, these kind of qualities but what qualities do you have to offer? So we don't think about our own self but we want the best for ourselves. Okay? So Islam is you know it's an easy religion. You, you judge other people at an easier level and you'll be harsh on yourself if you want to be. So, he did not make any difficulty for you in the religion. Also Allah says, Allah wishes to lighten the burden for you, for man was created weak. SubhanAllah. Look at this verse. Allah is admitting he created mankind weak. So Allah is saying that that's why he wishes to lighten for you the Islamic practices, Islamic laws, Islamic rituals, your religion. Wants to make it easy for you because he's the one who created you weak. So why would he create you weak and send you a religion which is difficult? Doesn't make sense. He created you weak and he sent you a religion which is easy because he understands your weakness. SubhanAllah. So the point here is, the point to remember is whenever you feel there is any difficulty in religion, it could be due to two reasons you're feeling that. Okay. For sure it is wrong. For sure you are wrong. If you reach a conclusion, religion is too hard, you are wrong. You need to tell yourself, I am wrong. But why do I feel it is hard? Either I don't know it properly, that's why I am following something which is maybe too hard for me. I need to go research and see what the reality is in the religion. Or number two, I am not really uh, applying myself to my potential. I am not doing things to my top potential. That's why it's looking very hard to me. But once I start understanding the religion and once I start applying my potential to its true potential, then religion will be easy. Remember religion is never difficult. So whenever you reach that conclusion, this is too hard, you are wrong. You need to tell yourself I am wrong. Okay? It's either I don't know it or I am not applying myself properly. Here. Okay? Removal of difficulty. Because of this principle, Allah has enacted along with the divine laws a variety of legal concessions like the permission to break the fast and shorten and join the prayers during travel. So since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us we, and he knows that there will be instances where we might not be able to carry on with some of these laws, some of these rituals, some of these practices, Allah has given us concessions. Even within these easy practices, he has made concessions. For example, if you're traveling, Allah said, you can pray two rakahs instead of four. Now, what's the difference between praying two and four? How much time are you going to save? How much time are you going to save if you pray two versus four? What, what, what would that be? A couple of minutes, three minutes. Does that really make too much difference? No, but look at Allah. He's even, you know, given you a concession of those three minutes in your travel. Those few extra seconds, few extra minutes in your travel. Because he understands when you're traveling, your mood is different. When you're traveling, you have anxiety. When you're traveling, you're in a new place. You don't know about this place. You feel uncomfortable. You feel like a stranger. So in order to minimize that, subhanAllah, especially for us who are living in the West, in a non-Muslim country, you're traveling somewhere and you're afraid, well, I don't want to pray here in front of all these people. They might do some harm to me. SubhanAllah, so instead of four, it's a quick two and you're done. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you're on your way. So it's an ease from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, permission to break fast. Let's say you dehydrated yourself and you, you have a medical emergency or something. And you were fasting, you can you should break your fast. In that case, you have to break your fast in order to save your life. Okay? Or you should not be fasting in certain times of, for, for example, for sisters when they're going through their menstrual cycles. Or for sisters, you know, who are you know going through their uh, breastfeeding phase. Or for you know, they have concessions or in those areas because Allah understands that there is weakness. 
Allah understands that there is difficulty involved in those areas. When it's raining, what do we do in the masjid? We join the prayers. Why? Because for somebody who is walking in the rain, for somebody who is walking in the snow, it will be difficult to come to the masjid for the next prayer. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the religion easy and He has provided us with a lot of concessions. Moreover, the consumption of prohibited substances like pork and alcohol in cases of dire necessity was also permitted. And you are dying from hunger and you have nothing else to eat but pork. You are allowed that pork is, becomes halal for you as much as you need. It doesn't mean you, you, know, you go for it and say, I've never had pork in my life, this is my chance. Let me have as much as I want. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> whatever, is, whatever is necessary for you to survive. Or alcohol, the same thing. You have nothing else to drink and you need to drink something. So once again, that becomes halal for you in those instances. So this is the ease and the flexibility in the religion. No other religion provides you with such flexibility. If you go to the Old Testament laws, you, you don't find any concessions with those laws. That's how it is. You have to do it or you're basically violating the laws. There is no concessions. Also Allah says, but if anyone is forced by hunger with no inclination to transgression, Allah is indeed of forgiving most merciful. So this is a general verse talking about, you know, whenever you are in difficulty and you do something which is in regular cases haram. Somebody on gunpoint asks you, are you a Muslim? You know if you said yes, you know, you'll, go, you'll be the goner, you're gone for good, right? So then in the, those cases, you're allowed to say no. In order to save your life, you're allowed to lie. Things which, lying is haram. And especially lying about your religion, saying I'm not a Muslim, that's a, a great lie. But that becomes permissible for you in a life-threatening situation where you're saving your life. So subhanAllah, this is the ease in the religion which Allah has given. The Prophet ﷺ, who is the best example for us, always chose the easier of the two ways when he had an option. Prophet peace be upon him said, whenever I am given two options, we are talking about halal options here. You know, a lot of times people, they, say, they, they interpret this hadith to mean between the haram and the halal, take the easy one. No, that's not what it means. It means you have two halal options. One is a little more difficult, the other one is easier. You go for the easy one. Prophet peace be upon him always would go for the easy one. When the Prophet peace be upon him was mentioning the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, in the story of Prophet Joseph peace be upon him, we have the instance where Yusuf alayhi salam is in the prison because of what happened between him and the women, uh, and they put him in the prison unjustly. And you know, then the king he saw the dream, so he asked his his court. Anyone knows this dream? So one of the guys who was with Yusuf alayhi salam remembered him that he he can interpret dreams. So he went to him, and Yusuf alayhi salam interpreted the dream. And then the king wanted him to come out so that he can honor him, so that he can give him a position in the government. Yusuf alayhi salam said, no, I'm not going to come out until you first decide between what happened. Decide my case first, clear my name between me and those women. Okay, then I'm going to come out and then I'm going to receive whatever honor you want to give me. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, when he was narrating this uh, story to the Sahaba, he said, if I was instead of Yusuf alayhi salam, I would have taken that option. The easy option of coming out first. Okay, Yusuf alayhi salam disagreed. He said, I'm not coming out until you first. Let those women come and decide between us. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, I would have taken the easier option. This is his sunnah. Every prophet has his sunnah for his nation. The sunnah of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him for us, for this nation is take the easy option if it's halal. If it's halal, go for the easy option. Don't try to make your life difficult, unnecessary. Okay? Thinking that you know it is somehow more righteousness or more piety or whatever. You can take the easier option and there is no problem in that. Also, the Prophet peace be upon him, he instructed Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Mu'adh ibn Jabal was the companion whom he sent to Yemen as a governor. And he gave him a lot of advice. And actually Mu'adh ibn Jabal, when he was going, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he said, uh, listen to my words carefully because the next time you might come back to Medina, you might see my grave which was meaning Mu'adh ibn Jabal, this is my last meeting with you. 
and I'm sending you to Yemen. And Ma'ad ibn Jabal was crying when he heard these words. And he indeed, when he came back, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was dead. And he saw his grave in Medina. But when he sent him to Yemen, one of the things he told him was, make things easy for the people and do not make life difficult for them. Okay? So as governors, as people who are responsible, imams or whatever, if you're in a government position or if you're responsible for other people, as leaders, one of the things you need to remember is, what can I do to make things easy for people? To make things simple for the people? What can I do to make things more enjoyable for the people? Okay? This is all part and parcel of leadership. That you do not be harsh, you do not be hard on people, but you be easy on the people. Many legal laws have been deduced on this principle by Islamic scholars. Using this principle of taking the easier option, removing difficulty. So if the Islamic scholars had two options, both of them were halal from reliable sources, one of them seemed easier than the other, they were inclined towards the easy option in many, many, many cases. Okay. Prayer, for example, makes it easier for us to remember Allah. I mean, imagine if you are told to remember Allah five times a day without prayer. There is no prayer on your own. It's your job to remember Allah for 10 minutes, five times a day. How many of us would be able to do that for an extended period of time? We forget Allah as soon as we come out of the masjid. <laughs> we forget Allah as soon as the prayer is over. Even inside the prayer, we forget Allah. SubhanAllah. Even those 10 minutes you're in the prayer, who amongst us can claim those 10 minutes for each second Allah was in my heart? You cannot claim that. So SubhanAllah, Allah knows that. And so He has made the religion, you know, uh, in such a way, designed it in such a way that you will be forced to remember Him. Five times a day, you have no other option. You have to come to the prayer. You have to pray. Whether you like it, you don't like it. It will make your rem remembrance of Allah easy. So even though the prayer itself might seem difficult for you, but it makes your remembrance of Allah easy for you. It makes it automatic for you. Okay? If you look at fasting, fasting trains us to give up the halal, which in turn makes it easier for us to leave the haram. What is fasting all about? Inshallah, we'll be fasting in a month's time in Ramadan. You are giving up things which are halal for you. Food and drink, halal for you. You know, relations with your wife, halal for you. Okay, many, many things you give up which are okay for you. Now, if you can give up something which is halal for you, don't you think it will be easier for you to give up something which is haram for you? That's how fasting trains you. Something which is, you know, okay for you to do, if you have the strength and courage to say, I don't, I'm not taking this food which is in front of me. I'm not going to drink that water which is available to me. Then you will have greater strength next time alcohol is presented to you. You'll have greater strength when next time, you know, an evil option is given to you. You will say no. You will reject it more easily. So fasting trains you to reject haram more easily. It makes it easy for you to reject haram by rejecting halal in that one month. Zakah trains us to share, be generous, show gratitude to Allah, which makes it easier to thank Him in times of trials. When you give zakah to somebody, you share your wealth, you get a feeling, you say, Alhamdulillah, I am the one who is giving. SubhanAllah. When you give somebody, it gives you the feeling, Alhamdulillah, I am not the one asking. I am the one Allah blessed me so that I can help somebody. Allah gave me so that I can give somebody. So you naturally learn to be thankful of what you have. Because you are sharing it with somebody. Now, in times when you won't have the wealth and you will be in difficult situation, that training will be with you and you will continue thanking Allah. Zakah trains you to be gracious, to be, uh, to be showing gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So each and every of these pillars, which we think are rituals, they actually make our life easier in the long, long run. Okay? When you run a mile every day, that running a mile every day is hard. It's hard. It's not an easy job running. I'm going to run a mile every day. But when it comes time for you when you need to use your speed to get to somewhere, because you have been running a mile every day and you've trained hard, 
It's easy. In time when you need that running, it's easy for you. Whereas the other guys who have been just sleeping and being sluggish and lazy and they've not kept up their body or whatever, they're not in shape. Yeah, their life might be easy because they're not going through that mile every day. But when it comes time for them to do the hard work, it's difficult for them because they've not trained themselves. So subhanAllah, our religion, it trains ourselves for the real challenges in our life. And those real challenges become easy because of this constant training which we are going through. And we don't even notice that this is changing us. The five times a day prayer, for example, disciplines you. Gives you the understanding of the value of time. You cannot lose time. My fajr is going. My maghrib is about to end. I need to do something. Okay? Gives you that urgency, respect for time. It gives you a discipline in your schedule. Okay, this is the time I need to eat. This is the time I need to go to work. This is the time I need to sleep. If I don't sleep, then I won't get up. If I won't get up, I'll miss my fajr. See, it gives you the respect and organization in your life. Which in turn helps you be an organized person as a whole in your life. Which helps you in your job, which helps you in your family, it helps you in every, every aspect of your life. So subhanallah, our religion is designed to make life easy for us if we practice it properly. So, I think we're going to stop with this point here. So today we talked about the removal of difficulty, the spirits, the spirit of Islamic law in general. Anyone has any questions or comments?